Welcome to Dadula's Daughters, the podcast in partnership with Solis. I go by the name Ilya Ali, and today I'm with Teresa. Hello. The resilient, strong, powerful Teresa. Um, thanks for being here with me today. That's fine. Um, I really appreciate you. And I'm just ready to get straight into it. Um, I think that you're phenomenal. Um, and Thank I feel you. like you have so much to add, so much value to add to so many people's lives with your story. Um, and just, you know, your relatability as well um, in delivering that message and that story. Um, so I'm going to go straight in with the first question, which is like, where did it all begin for you? What's your earliest memory? I think my memory, obviously my dad died when I was 15 months old. Um, obviously, I don't remember that, but obviously I've always known that I've not had a dad. Mm. I've never had any male figure in my life. Um, my uncle, I, we used to live with my uncle, and I, I remember going to my mum and saying that I wanted her to marry my uncle so that then we'd be a family. Mm. So even when I was little, I knew that I wasn't part of a family. So you knew something was missing. Yeah, I knew something was missing. Yeah. Um, my nan used to look after me. She died when I was four. Um, I think my mum, when my mum was a widow, she was only 26, 27. Um, you know, she was, she was young and good-looking and vivacious and, you know, going out and painting the town, which, you know. Um, and I was left. You know, then we went from place to place, you know, a single mother working. Um, so I was a bit of a latchkey kid mm. um, in the 60s, which, you know, most, most families in the 60s, you, you know, that wasn't the case. Um, then we'd moved to a little village and she'd obviously had an affair with a married man. My brother came along, who I loved, but I knew things weren't quite right indoors. One, my mum used to be with Brendan's dad all the time mm. and go away for weekends and not with me by the way I hated Brendan's dad and was very vocal about it mm. which obviously caused problems you know and this was I was a little girl myself mm. how old know, was you roughly around eight the time? okay I think I probably was about six when she met him mm. and if he ever did used to come I used to say you're not my dad don't tell me what to do you mm. know I was very strong and opinionated even then mm. um but as I say, so my mum had started going out and drinking. And as I say, she was an attractive woman. Mm. And even though I didn't understand it then, I now understand it more. Mm. I'd come down sometimes and there'd be young men where she'd been out in the evening and brought mm -hmm. them home with her. Um, and don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not painting my mum in a bad light. Of course not. God rest her soul. But I'm just saying, from when you're a young girl, it's quite strange. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and she was going to the same clubs that I started going at when I was 12. Okay, so you started drinking alcohol from 12 yes. as well? Yes. Um, I had to go home at quarter to 12 in a cab, so I'd lie and say I was staying with someone, spend a cab fare, um, all those things. Yeah. I was really, really mature at a very, very young age. Yeah. Would you say your mum used alcohol as her vice? That was her release yes, to, to fill that void. My mum was a party girl. She was the life and soul mm. of the party. Even at my auntie's at Christmas, she'd be ice skating down the passage because she'd had yeah. a drink, standing on her head. Everybody loved her. It, all the men loved her. You, you know, she was a man, man you know, they, she turned heads. Mm. Um, and she was my mum. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I'd like to boy and we'd all gone home, they'd driven me home from this club, and we were indoors, I'd given them tea, and she turned up, the guy she was with went straight upstairs, and she she was saying, now which one's, and it, it, you know, which one's so-and-so, like this boy that I liked, mm -hmm. and then got in the middle of them, and, but that was my mum, mm. you, you know, and as I say, it, it sounds awful, but, in the embar I was so, so embarrassed. I was mortified. Mm. I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to remember, I was like 13. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's like anybody who's grown up in a household with a mum who has, or any parent who has an addiction. Yeah. That's where I feel like we first start to identify or connect with those emotions of shame, guilt. Oh, my God. Like, it's embarrassment, like what and you're you, saying. And you know as well, I must tell you, 
this the mother's helpers bit you know years ago i mean it's not the same now but the being prescribed valium mm. my mum obviously was prescribed because she was a widow you can imagine uh, she was heartbroken pain, yeah. but also these these tablets that they gave to people you know uh, as i say yeah she was on them which and people don't think they're drug addicts but that you know they were addicted to, to pharmaceuticals even then mm. and that then changes the way you are and i used to always just feel i don't know Unless my mum was out and enjoying herself, the flatness. Mm. And it's only just occurred to me. You know of how flat... It's two extremes. So yeah. it's either she's like yes. the outgoing person, the life yes. of the party, and then when she doesn't have that, that vice that she's using, it's flat, And I think maybe cold. I used to think that I should... I know it. I know it for a fact. I, I remember one of my first memories. I... Saved up all my change, and it, again, you wouldn't know this, in an Allen and Hanbury's black currant and glycerin tin, mm. you know, like a throat pastel tin. Okay. And she was crying. We were in a flat. It was damp. There was an outside toilet because my uncle had got married, so we'd had to move. And I just, you know, we were talking earlier about courage pants. I just wanted my mum to be happy. Mm. And, she, and I said, you can have this, and I'd given her my money mm -hmm. because I'd... And he, so I, it's like I was responsible for her, her happiness mm. at such a young age. Really? That's difficult, yeah. What would you say, like, your relationship was like with her? Was it healthy? Was it quite negative? Like, would she lash out on you? No, she didn't ever lash out at me or anything. Um, she did. She used to smack me in that, but, I mean, they did then. Mm. Um, and I used to laugh. I, I've just always had this. I've, I've always had a very strong character, but... Nothing I ever did was right. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Mm. Whatever I did, whether I was really good at school, whether whether I was naughty at school, nothing was right. I, I just feel I was criticised. I just think that all she ever, you know, she, and I'm sure she didn't mean to do it, but I just did grow up thinking nothing was right. Yeah. No matter which way I... I whether it was black or whether it was right, whether it was off or on, it was wrong. Mm. You know. And um, did she give you any guidance or any sort of direction, or she would just criticise all the time? Not really. Yeah. I, I think she just did her best, but you know, if I said to her, "I'm not going to school today because they're doing um, vaccinations," or I, I didn't have to go, mm. if they were doing offal at school or fish, I'd say, "I'm not going to school today." And even though my mum was a strong character, and I'm not saying I was a stronger character, I don't know. I think she used to let me get my own way. I, I think I was ill a lot as a child as well. Mm -hmm. And my uncle used to spoil me. I think I was, a, a, I was spoiled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I was, you know, I do wonder whether I've, this spoiltness has followed me through my life mm -hmm. when I think about it. You know, like in this, I don't know. Where did you first hear that? Who was the, who told you you were spoiled? Me. Okay. Yeah. That's and I don't know. And I think other people, as as we were saying earlier as well, this lucky thing, there's no... My ceiling didn't open up and all this luck fell down on me. <laughs> or things or, or yeah. whatever. Designer shoes or whatever. Or boyfriends or cars or, mm. you know... You, I have fought my whole life for anything. Mm. You know, the same as, you know, I've lost more than most people would ever have in their lives. Mm. But what I'm saying is, you know, this luck thing. But as I say, and I think being spoilt, the connotations, again, mm -hmm. of the, the being spoilt. And, you know, no one has actually ever spoilt me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So why? I'm just, I'm now thinking about it. You know, like when... And again, it's it, you're of a different generation to me. But when you have your first baby, usually your parents buy you your pram, mm. um, or when when you move into a flat. And again, you, you wouldn't understand. Your mum buys you your fridge. No one ever bought me a fridge or a pram or nothing. You know. And again, I don't want. I wouldn't want it any other way mm. because whatever I've got, I've got myself, mm. and I think that's important to me. It's like that is, the, and even now, that's the person. 
and I'm proud of that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've, I've I've maybe had to do things halfway, but I just feel that it's more valuable now. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. Um. So, how, when did, what age was you when you left the house? Um. And how did you leave? Like, what was that transition? I mean, this is the, so. The reason I left, which again, you know nothing about any of this, I had I'd fallen in love with a skinhead, yeah, the, the leader of all the London skinheads, who was very prolific in the British movement, mm -hmm. who who went to prison for racist attacks. Okay, he was older than. I think he was um, I think he was seven years older than me. Right, and how old was you when you got with him? 17 okay anyway and i'd done really well at school even though uh, i'd worked in a chemist and used to steal the sleeping tablets and be in the exams asleep on the desk <laughs> you know um give again though not giving them all to people because i don't know it's just this but so i'd gone to college and I was living at home. Mm. And the college was in Broadstairs. I wanted to look after children that maybe, you know, were physically or mentally impaired or whatever. Mm. Anyway, and I'd and we started going up to London. I used to be a soul girl mm. and go up to Lacey Ladies, and but I'd got in with the skinheads anyway, and we'd go up and we'd go to football on Saturdays, and they'd beat everybody up, and mm. you know. Um, and I mean, obviously, it's it's a different time, but and so I'm not actually sure how I can say this. But, you know, let's just say he was really, really racist. Right. They all, you know, and he was the leader of them all. As I say, he used to go away for weekends with the British movement as a leader guard and train with guns, and you know, it was very naughty. Mm. As I say. Um, and so I joined the British movement. I I was brought up in folks and I didn't know anything about race. Mm. I really didn't. There wasn't any any ethnic minorities down in Folkestone. Mm -hmm. Um and as I say, and I'd gone home one day and I think that my mum must have known I'd been on a march or something, or I might have had a badge on or something. Mm. This is all it's not awful, this was part of my life. Right. But I'm gonna. I'm. I'm just gonna tell it how it is. I used to go around with stickers, saying race. I can't even say the words, Alia. But yeah. race mixing destroys our people. Right. And put. Uh, but this is what I'm saying. I didn't even know mm. what I was doing, but I did it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I. It's the first time I've thought about that for years and years. Anyway. So we'd had a row and she threw me out, but I took the balcony door key and when she wasn't there, I went back and emptied my whole bedroom mm -hmm. and emptied my whole life and left. Wow. Um, so even though she thought it was just a row and I would go home, I didn't go home. Mm. You know. Yeah. So where did you go? Um, I went and got a studio flat mm -hmm. in Folkestone, tried to carry on going to college and doing the right thing because underneath it, well, I was quite a good girl. Yeah. Um, but you couldn't, you could be paid unemployment to do nothing, but you couldn't be paid unemployment if you were under 18 to go to college. So I ended up having to, that went by the wayside. And then I came to London. Mm. And then that was a different story again. Well, let's get into it. Yeah, were you still with it. him when you came to London? The joke being, he, I don't know if I ever was with him. I slept with him a couple of times. It turned out, I'm going forward now, he, he was really, he, he, he died of AIDS. He actually was gay. Wow. He was into S&M. And even though he was at the forefront of all the marches and the racist attacks, it was, it's, he's actually famous. It, if you look it up, it's in the papers. Mm. Um, my, the kid's dad used to say that, like, Matthew's dad used to say that he was Nicky Crane's, which obviously he wasn't. Mm. I don't think I actually did sleep with him. Anyway, mm. um, 
But yeah, he, he died. It turned out he, he came out as gay. He used to work at the clubs, like heaven and that on the door. Okay. But it turned out he actually was gay. He wasn't just fronting a door. Yeah. So yeah, and I think he he turned his life around as su in, in as much as, you know, like the racist things. Mm. I think he probably ended up with a black boyfriend. What? And yeah. And he actually, this is, he actually was so nice. Do you know, deep down, he was such a nice boy mm. and so mixed up. But again, I'm going back 43 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But anyway, but that was one part of it. Ended up with Matthew and Mark's dad, who had an alcoholic father. Got pregnant with Matthew when I was 17. Right. So all that happened quite fast. All of that must have happened in a span of a, of a yeah, year. Yeah, it did. 17's the year my yeah. life changed as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was with, I'd gone down to Margate because obviously mods and punks and skinheads used to go to the seafront on bank mm. holidays. It's, it was like, you know, they're renowned for it. And I remember I was talking to Nicky Crane and Matthew and Mark's dad that is now. I was with him and he came along, headbutted me. He got arrested. I'd got a white dress on with black circles covered in blood. I don't know. Maybe that was the start of my life as I'm, you know. Yeah. yeah. Because I ended up with him, found out I was pregnant. Um, and then had one child on to, you know, really quickly with the other. As I say, I was pregnant at 17, had Matthew at 18 mm -hmm. in London, had no one, no family. Mm. You know, my mum was in Folkestone. Um, did you still have a relationship with your mum at this time or do you guys? Yes, had... I did. I used to ring her every day. To, to be told what I was and what I wasn't and okay you know yeah but obviously obviously I still rung no matter what and even to this day I mean she's dead now but I've never ever raised my voice I've never shouted I've never sworn you know I, mm. I don't know I just always have had respect for well, my mum mm -hmm, mm -hmm. through it all I think yeah so how long I was think that's living? really important and that you know yeah. When I think about it. How long was you with um, your first, not your first, your... The your, kid's dad. Yeah, the kid's dad. I was with him off and on for years. Um, and he was, an, his dad was an alcoholic and so was he. Um, you know, when I had my second son, th this was my life, but I'm just saying, obviously I knew he had a girlfriend. Um, I'd actually, this sums it up, because obviously we haven't got a week mm. sitting here. He he had a picture of him and Matthew and Mark. Mark was three weeks old and he'd given it to his girlfriend. He, you know, he was really ignorant. He wasn't, I say ignorant, he was brought up a totally different way to me. He had no education, that's mm. what I mean. Um, but again, this punk skinhead thing you, you get with people that you would have nothing in common with, really. Mm you know in the cold light of day but anyway and then obviously he'd have a drink then he'd hit me and Matty used to hide get under steps or hide behind doors Mark just didn't care you know Mark would see me beaten up and then say where's his dinner you know I had two very different children wow um and I just had that for years I'd throw him out and then I'd take him back um you know I used to think he loved me um you know and it was my fault mm. if, if he was sleeping with other people it was my fault because i didn't want to sleep with him and you know everything was my fault really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and as i say and i used to just comfort myself with my kids and going up to the west end and buying big things of pampers and you know i don't know that i was really happy with children yeah i wanted to have my babies but i wasn't happy with him otherwise i think i might have had 10 babies right you know but as I say, so even then, I, it was the comfort thing of, as I say, buying something to cheer myself up, you know, like just all those sort of things, mm. you know. And I mean, I, I went through some things, you know, awful things with him, awful. You know, one of my children was in, in hospital and he'd come there drunk. I used to go to work at a babysitter and the hospital ended up telling me I had to leave because the pair of us couldn't be there because the police were called. So he had to be there, drunk at my baby's bedside, 
asleep because he could, was, wasn't was sober. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Cause and I had to terms, leave. How, would, how did the system even used to respond to domestic violence and, and women that were in abusive situations back then? Because we, we still haven't even, haven't even got to a place in the conversation yeah. Listen, with the government where it makes sense. Uh, even now it doesn't make sense, does yeah. it? Once, I'll tell you, I, I worked four nights a week in a club as a waitress yeah. from 10 till 2 in the morning for my babies. Not so I didn't drink, I, I didn't want to party or have other men. Or, you know, it was, it was to make a better life mm. because Dennis used to drink all the money. Sometimes on a Friday night he wouldn't come in and I'd have to look for him with two babies in a pushchair uh, trying to find him to get any money. Mm. I had no money, you know. I know my mum would have given me, but you, you don't want to tell other people what's gone on anyway and I used to get a babysitter pay her more than I even earned anyway so I'd gone to work got the babysitter the next thing the police had turned up at this club I worked at and they had found Matthew was I think n just gone to they'd found him downstairs I lived in a flat in a masonette in Roman Road they'd found him wandering around he'd got himself dressed mm. to, so the police escorted me home with my door keys mm. and Dennis was unconscious with a friend on my baby's bed as I say Matthew had been found outside by thank God a little girl downstairs who the girl had recognized and said that's that's you know my friend babysits for mm -hmm, her mm -hmm. upstairs but there's a baby there so the police said to me, so obviously I got the kids and I went round to my friends. The police said to me, had, and my voice is breaking telling you this, had they have had to break the door down, they would have taken both of my children and put them in care. Mm. Because that's what they would have had to do. Yeah. I mean, luckily I opened the door. But and again, I took him back. After that? After that. So what age was you when you got away? Oh, when you like got the, the courage uh, to really th No, throw, throw, threw him out, took him back, threw him out, took him back. Um, I think probably Mark was three. Um, yeah. And then I had a stage of really feeling sorry for myself. Um, that without him I was nothing. The baby had shoes, holes in his shoes and all that. And I remember Dennis coming round. I mean, I'm just sort of trying to sum it up. He came round... And he bought a record, um, Long Hot Summer, the Style Council, same as you're the best thing that ever happened to me. He'd got that record, he'd bought himself this, bought himself that. Mm. My baby had holes in his shoes. And I just suddenly went on the turn and I just thought, you know what? Mm. I will sh show you. Mm. I will show everybody. And that was it. He didn't give me, I think, he didn't give me a single, he gave me £200 in five years. Wow. Which he'd come round drunk and given me his work cheque for £200. Um, and his girlfriend at the time had run creating. But that was the only money he ever gave me. I just did everything on my own, mm. obviously. And I just decided that I would do it all. But I then decided to do checkbooks and cards. Mm. One minute, I have a question. Done. So, like, from what age did you feel like you was alone? When did that feeling of like, okay, I'm I'm alone, I've got to figure this life stuff out by myself, what age did you have that realisation? I think always, I think I always felt like I was the odd one out. Yeah. I think the fact that I didn't have a dad, uh, when everyone else did, every every other person that I went round to the house had a dad. Yeah. Uh, in all honesty, I know that you are daddyless daughters. Yeah. And that, but when I think about it. Yeah. My cousins, they, they had mums and dads. Everyone had mums and dads but me. Mm. And not just me, obviously, but at that... That's how it feels, that's yeah. That's how it felt, that I I wasn't, you know, not, not... You know, we say normal. I hate saying that now, but I didn't fit in, you know, and everything was just my mum and my mum worked. And again, I understand that now, mm. but my mum worked, you know... So, no. It, Did you ever used to think, like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Why can't I have that? Yeah. Mm. And just feeling that I wasn't good enough and not pretty enough. and not, I don't know. Just, and I don't know, maybe I acted out 
to, you know, for attention, I don't know, maybe... To compensate for it, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm, we do. I'm thinking about, and I'm just thinking, and even now, you know, like I'd said earlier about jewellery and dresses and that, I don't know, because I want attention, but I don't want attention. I don't know, it's, it's, it's so tangled up. Even, I'm 60 years of age, mm. and it's still... I haven't got the answers. It's still so tangled up. Mm. And I try and get to the bottom of it all. But it, and also, I think that if you try and start analysing, you'll just make yourself even more unhappy thinking about it all. Mm. But you do have to have an answer to move on. Yeah. So it, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is hard. And as I say, I, I, you know, I used to be at my happiest when I used to stay at my auntie's with my uncle and he, he'd come in from work at night. This was what I thought was the typical, this mm. is why I tried so hard with Dennis. Mm. And he'd come in with sweets for us all, like my, my two cousins and myself. Mm. And he bought me in a briefcase when I started school because he worked at Plessis or ITT or something. And I'd got my own briefcase to school. And you, you know, just the things that dads did. Mm. Um, and that's why when when my kids were little, the snowman, like this cartoon of the snowman, the, the boy that builds the snowman, mm -hmm. and he goes in and and the mum and the dad are there and the dad's reading the paper and the mum's cooking breakfast. I thought that was how I wanted my life to be mm. because I didn't have a dad. Mm. So I, I tried so hard to keep it together to have the mum and dad. Mm. And then I guess you, you've gone on. No matter how the dad was, yeah. but the dad wasn't a dad. And even my son, even three days ago, he said, I know daddy was never there for me. It was always you. You always did what dads do. Mm. It's always you. I fought his battles. I fought men. Mm. Um, you know, if someone did something to my kids, I was there. I was always there for my kids. Because his, he never was, because he was drinking, mm. you know, and I didn't want my kids to ever feel that they didn't have, you know, that they weren't from a normal family and a mum and a dad and all that. Mm. So I was the mum and the dad. And that's why you stayed with him for so long. Uh, to just keep trying. Yeah. And when he was, again, when he'd done something wrong, I would then say to him, and I want this passage decorated and you're, we're going to the beach and... Because he, he was guilty, so he'd try his best, but he was an alcoholic. Mm. He's still an alcoholic. He's still sitting now. He can't walk because the alcohol is, you know. Yeah. And as I say, and even now, I still, I look after him. I sort his benefits out because my, my son had said to me, Mum, can you help Dad? And he went, I went, I'm not, I can't be helping Dad, you know. And he went, but you must have some love somewhere for him. <laughs> And yes, I love him because he's the father of my children. Yeah. But I have, and this is wicked, but I have no, the, what he put me through, you know. Yeah. As I say, love's a strange word, isn't it? But yeah, so I still do for him now. Because that's me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know. So when you left him now, you started going and doing scams, scamming. Checkbook and card, <laughs> kiting. Tell us about that life. On my own. Yeah. Never a man. Never ever a man. And again, OTT. My children, I'd pick Matthew up from nursery and they'd say, um, can we go home and watch children's program? And I'd say, yes, we're just going shopping. Mm. I've been shopping all day. I'd be shopping all night. I'd be at Brent Cross. Extras. Always mm. extras. I used to have someone do the strips myself so that the uh, I just did it all and really really extras so when I finally was arrested mm. I think they searched my house and again I didn't come from a criminal upbringing so I didn't know anything I just did what I had to do and the kids and the shoes and the Benetton jumpers and yeah. you know um, when I was arrested it was a really big thing. Like Eleven cars pulled in on me. Mm. They knew who I was. I'd, I'd been grassed, by the way. Okay. Um, they knew who I was. They knew where I lived. They knew that I'd got a new cooker. They knew I'd had my settee covered. They knew everything. Wow. 
Um, so that was you under surveillance? They'd been yeah. watching you and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And they found, I think, 67 checkbooks because again, I'm extras. Mm. All the strips. I'd got them in a in a rum tough pot on the top of my kitchen unit. You know, they they took off my plugs. Yeah. They did everything because a girl, another girl that I was friendly with, who was also caught because she'd come out with me that day. She she'd got Charlie on her, but th th this was not me. I didn't know anything about this sort of. Obviously, I knew about it, but yeah. it wasn't me. You know, I was with my kids. Anyway, they put, peeled up my carpets. They looked in my record covers. They were looking for something else. Mm. But anyway, they were also. This was the mad thing, and I had cars that were ringers, all this sort of thing. All that I'd done myself, because this is what I'm saying. If I do it, I've got to do it mm. to the best of my ability. <laughs> to the best yeah if i'm cleaning it has to be uh, i i can't just do that i've got to pull it all out mm, and this mm. is me this is my nature mm. anyway so when i was arrested i didn't say anything blah blah they've interviewed me they would not believe they 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 said about the car and that and they said they couldn't even get into the car because they were trying to open it the wrong way anyway they and i I was trying to tell them it was me. They wouldn't believe it. So then they came back and they said, listen, we need you to be sensible. You, you know, you, you've you got two children. They're going to end up, they're going to go into care, mm. blah, blah, blah. Which I knew that was all rubbish. Yeah. Right? And your friends told us all about you. Anyway, and I knew that was, remember, I was quite intelligent. Yeah. And in the end, I broke down. I mean, this just sums it up, really. I broke down and I went, there's this guy. And... He knew I was a man. And they, they loved it. They believed every word of it. <laughs> they wanted for it to be a man. Yeah. No, they did. They wanted it to be... Because I wasn't capable of, of doing it on a man, was I? Yeah. Because I... And I used to... I didn't just do £50 checks. I mean, again, I, I'd go to Brent Cross and write a check for £800. We're talking about back in the early 80s, yeah. you know. Anyway... um. So, as I say, so I got caught, I got caught and prosecuted for com um, with conspirators unknown. Mm. And I got three years, first offence, single mother, never been in trouble in her life. Wow. And that was me in the prison system. Tell a lie. I was on remand. Yeah. I know. I was bailed. And then decided that some of my again. money I'd get an ex escort convertible and I was out there again doing it again and when they nicked me again outside Marx's in Oxford Street they actually again they'd been on me they'd been listening to my conversations mm. I know that sounds mad because it was just me but they thought I was in a ring mm. this was what it was they thought they would catch Mr Big but there wasn't a Mr Big and they actually they didn't even know the way home I had to guide them home because I knew all the back doubles in London again because I was up there every day right doing checks this was me again extras anyway so this time I, I went into prison on remand and obviously then that was a different story that um would you say that was the beginning of a different cycle now different patterns that that you was welcome into your life I think first of all my mum stepped up right and had the kids okay which the only, you know, she did come and babysit once before when me and Dennis went to the pictures in Mile End. And when I got home, she got her things together and said, I'm never, ever coming here again. Mm. And because Matthew had been crying the whole time. I only had Matthew. Okay. Um, m m m you know, she didn't used to do those sort of things. Anyway, so that, that as I say, so she stepped up and had the kids. Um, and... I don't know. First of all, I'm, I was sort of quite powerless, wasn't I? Because I, I, I was told now what to do. And I was sort of thrown in with girls that I would never in a million years have mixed with. Mm, um, mm. You know, that part of me. It, but again, I was still sort of me. You know, I'd got my Walkman sent in. and my, I mean, you know, this is quite a strange story. Do you want me to tell you this story about when I was in prison? Yeah. So I was still me with my little outfits and this was when I was on remand. You got, you went to Holloway? Yeah. Yeah. Went to Holloway. It was such a shock, mm. such an 
actual shock. What year was this, like? 1986, okay. I believe. Anyway. Um, yeah, it might have been 1985. Okay. Mark wasn't at school yet, and Mark was born in 1981. Anyway. So you could then have food bought in, mm. and a, you could have a glass of wine bought in if you wanted. Is it? Yes, all those sort of things. Because until all the, the drug addicts came and ruined everything, yeah. you could have flowers bought in. Um, you know, there's so many things. Anyway, you could have a visit once a month with the kids, you know, not in a prison setting as yeah. such, by the swimming pool. Anyway. They even had the swimming pool back then? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so I... I was living the life of luxury, really. My mum used to come, or my friend, you know, and I'd have bits bought in, and the clothes, the naff naff, and, you know. Mm. And it, we were in a dorm. There were six people in the dorm then. Mm. Anyway, and I'm on the top bunk, and I'm listening to the music, and the other girls, and obviously this is, I've always, I'm a bit of a storyteller. I'm quite well educated. I yeah. read books. And I'd keep all the other girls entertained. They were very different girls, but again, we're all in prison. Mm. Um, but, you know, they had a history of drug. You know, one of the girls had fingers as fat as sausages where she'd injected diaconal wow. into her fingers. She'd come out of the toilet one day. They'd, they'd nicked a box of needles from the dispensary. The whole prison was on lockdown for them trying to find them. They'd managed to get a bit of sulfate in, so... But they'd included me in it because I'd included them in the food that I had bought in and all this sort of thing and this and cigarettes and all. Because you were allowed 200 fags, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we used to arrange, the girl downstairs would get my fags in because I wanted more. Yeah. And then I'd buy her fruit, you know, it was a whole. So even then I was in the, in the system course, sort yeah. of thing. But saying to me, would I like some of this, these drugs, which... I was so aghast at it all, and she's come out of the toilet with a needle hanging out of her neck, and I'm like... What the hell? Because the, the, I knew nothing about that life. But anyway, so I'm in another dorm now, because I've gone to court. Anyway, I'm in another dorm now, and they decided to riot because someone... Not this dorm. Someone across the way in a single didn't get their medication. It was the worst riot Holloway has ever had. Now, meanwhile, I'm doing knitting... Patricia Roberts knitting, because that was the flavour of the day. Mm. All this intricate, lovely cotton, because, mm. again, I've got all the knitting in. Plastic needles that I had to file down on the windows outside because they'd break. So now the riot's taken off. Everything's being thrown out of the windows, the slit windows. Yeah. They're setting fire to everything. The whole prison now was absolutely on one. Mm. The whole prison. I'm now thinking, what's going on? Mm. And remember, they used to puff and everything, and they used to laugh because I never did puff, but my stories, they used to make them laugh because, I'd, I don't know, I just had stories telling it how it is without puffing. Yeah. You know, I think I just must be on a natural high. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, so I'm wrapping my knitting up now. You're talking about months of knitting earlier. Mm. Every stitch was different. Every colour was different. Wrapping it all up around all my clothes, they'd ripped the front of the locker so I put it in the locker turn the locker around because I knew they couldn't get the locker out of the window anyway they put the three bunk beds across the the, the room so mm. the, the the screws couldn't get into the room because by the time I come to Holloway they've they've nailed the beds to the floor so these yeah, times listen I'm even... telling you because of this right and because of this the doors all opened outwards that once this riot yeah anyway and obviously I'm in the room with the five girls I I don't know about medication, but I know that when you're a drug addict, you need your medication, whatever. Yeah. So I wasn't in it, but obviously I was supporting them, but I wasn't setting fire to things. But obviously, you're part of it. So by the time the screws did come in, mm. in the middle of the night, and I got dragged out with my arms up at behind my back, dragged along on my knees. I remember my jeans, because I'd put on weight, mm. they were undone. So as I'm being dragged along, and the block was full up, right. so that we had to be put on this A3, this disused wing, yeah. with filth, absolute filth. Anyway, I think they ended up letting me get out to do wing clean, because I had a thing about being clean. I was definitely OCD. Yeah, anyway, yeah. but as I say, and I got, I got punished for this, even though I wasn't in it, and I wasn't setting fire to things. 
And when I got taken to the governor with two screws either side facing that way, mm. and I'm facing that way, I didn't know what I had on. I had a retour cycling top on. Do you know? Wow. Anyway, and she said, you're accused of doing so and so and so and so. So I said, you're telling me that, that this, because this officer was in the room, you saw me doing that. But they did. They lied. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so I had three weeks added on to my sentence. Wasn't allowed to see anybody or... Uh, um, loss of privileges, the kids weren't allowed to come, mm. loss of spends, mm. like all those things. But in actual fact, that did have an impact on what happened next. Right. Because I was then labelled a trouble causer, which, and I wasn't. Yeah. I actually wasn't. I was a good girl. Mm. But these things then follow you, don't they? Of course. And I think it starts that mentality of like us versus them now. Yeah. Because you clearly can see he so lied. Then, they then sent me, when I was sentenced, as I said, I was sentenced to three years. They then sent me, you had to go to, to have a medical to, to leave the prison if you were going to be transferred. Anyway, so I'm in the doctor's surgery and, I'm, and the screws are standing there. So, and there was, I was saying, where are you going? And they're saying, style. Now I'm thinking I'm going to Cook and Wood because my mum lived in Folkestone, mm -hmm. Kent. I'm a Kent girl. Mm. In the end, I went, well, where am I going? And they went, you're going to style. I went, no. Style. In Manchester. Yeah, yeah. In Manchester. Yeah. No one ever went to style. Yeah. Ever. Right? They fixed you. That, and then mm. it said I could go on foot or in a blanket. Mm. I mean, I feel like I'm going on too much. I've got so many stories. On foot or in a blanket. So we went on a coach, believe it or not. I had 11 bags of possessions. And I went with... Nine Africans and an arsonist mm. because I was, and they put me on the nutty house because of the riot mm. with, as you said, things screwed to the floor. Yeah, yeah. And I, I said to them, I, I shouldn't be here. You can't mix. Because again, I was intentional. I said, you can't mix nutters with, uh, not, I didn't say nutters. Mm -hmm, I said, mm -hmm. you can't mix people that are mentally ill with, with people that prisoners. aren't mentally ill. Yeah. And they said, the more you carry on, the more you're staying here. Wow. So anyway, so I'm in style, as I say. And obviously, no one much liked me because they didn't like London girls, even though I wasn't a London girl, with the Hobbs little suit and the Hobbs shoes. Yeah, yeah. Dollying around up the park. <laughs> and with the girls from up north are a lot rougher than of us. Of course. <laughs> and my they mom, know struggle. My mum came to see me yeah. and I, I didn't even say hello to her. I was crying. I went, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Ring my solicitor. Get me out of here. I was... I think I was very demanding. I, I, I think I wasn't quite... I don't think I was even very nice, really. Mm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You know, she'd come all... Can you imagine tra travelling up to Stahl on the train? Yeah, yeah, from, from Kent. Anyway, and then six weeks later, they said, you're moving, and I started crying because I didn't want to move because yeah. I'd, I'd liked everyone now yeah. and yeah. I'd got in, you know, involved with anyone and I didn't want to go anywhere. Mm. Well, of course, the viewers, nobody knows this yet, but I do know this about you. Um, you've been to prison 38 times yep. in your life. <laughs> um, that's why I asked that question of, you know, do you think that that now start, started that cycle of I think I, I, when I was in prison, I saw how I saw the other side of things. Mm. Wh what would then possess me? to then go to that other side. Yeah, no. It, that's a big good question, isn't it? Because yeah. as, as I've said, I was looking in at these girls that did this type of thing and did this sort of behaviour because of drugs mm. and the medication and this whole kicking off. Mm. And obviously I was punished for it, even though I hadn't kicked off, mm. which I understand that as well. But what would possess me, me, uh, who loved this and loved that and loved money and... Love, I loved my kids with a vengeance. Mm. What would possess me to go to that other side? Would you say you became one of them girls? I became, I would say, not just one of those girls, much, much worse. Mm. Or not even worse. Um, I don't know, I can't even actually think of the right word. And you know, normally I'm really articulate. Again, let's take it back because mm. I've got to do things. 
so much extra extreme so mm. i not only became a crack addict but i was the best crack addict there was like mm. uh, how as i'm saying it's horrendous for me to say it but i get the mentality though I, I understand that and as i say i'm talking about it now obviously brings everything you know because i had to, i don't know I, the thought of it just again the amount of i only ever smoked crack i didn't take any other drug i didn't drink and how much of it i did and that's intense because mm. you're supposed to have that come down drug that something else no i never ever came down mm. i bombed apparently there's uh, you know I've, I've spoke to the crack expert you know he goes and does talks in other countries you know he um he worked at the Blenheim project um what was it called there's a special name for it anyway mm -hmm. um and he had only ever met one other person that that never came down so i would literally be bombing for weeks on end whereas everyone else did they took tablets they puffed they drank they obviously took heroin it was very hand in hand the heroin and the crack but i never did any of those things i, I just bombed mm. so what was what what was the next chapter of your life what was that like i was with dennis still he i he'd got a house now and i'd gone over to there i think mark was maybe 10 and a half I'd, anyway i'd gone back from my flat um what part of london east end okay. roman road yeah bow and again you see even though I, I wasn't doing the drugs i was doing the lifestyle like i was i was buying receiving stolen goods buying off of kids that stole that were drug addicts and it is quite an important part i suppose because i had a bmw convertible mm. there was only 200 made in the whole of england mm -hmm. bright green I always look the absolute, and again, I'm not vain. I'm talking about my outfits were just something else mm. because I had a really good shoplifter. The kids, don't get me wrong, the kids' outfits were paid for. They weren't stolen. But mm. what I'm saying is the money. I, I'd waitressed. I, I don't know. It's like I had to prove something to someone. I had to have the best of everything. My kids had to have the best of everything. Mm. All the trainers, all the gear, you know. I think even that, I may, may have been, a, before the, even the drug addiction, I was addicted to, I used to spend a £1,000, like, a month in, in this clothes shop. Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying to you earlier, I was listening to a lecture this morning about addiction, and, and the doctor was basically saying that it's still the same endorphins. Of course So your is. brain doesn't recognise, oh, this is crack, this is shopping, this is sex, yeah. this is, you're just releasing the of same course. endorphins in your, in your mind. So of course. I think well, you exposed yourself is. to that a lot earlier before you knew, I've, before you met I crack. I do believe, I've always liked, I'll tell you what I've always liked. Mm. I've always liked living my life on the edge of a cliff. That's what you was addicted to. I think yeah. that is probably what I was addicted to long before anything else like my mum once had said how can you take those kids away you don't know where you're going i'd gone on a one of those holidays where you don't know your destination mm. with thompson's or whatever it was at the time again i'm talking about the 80s with two kids this was long before the drugs and all that yeah and even before i was arrested yeah for, for check for but that was it and i hired a motorbike a moped I had one child on the back and one on the one on the back, Matthew, holding on to me, and one on the front, Mark, and then went off. No. I was at it already because I'd got fraudulent um, travellers' checks or something. Okay. Or checks that you did in a foreign... I was already at it. But anyway, and it was dark. How am I going to drive the bike and hold one boy, boy yeah. who was asleep and hold the other baby who was asleep? But I don't know, I did, this was me doing these things. I don't know, that pushing, pushing, pushing. Mm. And what, to prove something? I don't know. Mm. To, to who, I don't know exactly. Or to prove to myself that I was good enough and we were good enough and we, we didn't need anyone. And I don't know. I don't know the answers to these things. Mm -hmm. But 
So that was your relationship with crack. It was extreme. You was pushing the boundaries of it. I, and again, I fell in love with who I used to buy clothes off of. Mm. Um, but again, even, do you know something else? I used to work in a massage parlour, even though I had the car and everything else. Not as a prostitute. Yeah. My friend had got me the job on the reception. I'll tell you why, because someone had gossiped about me mm. and this guy that I used to work with in the club years ago had said, oh, everyone's saying you're either a prostitute or a drug dealer. And I went, oh, are they? Anyway, I was laughing because mm. I wasn't a prostitute or a drug dealer. But also this thing, I'll show you. Yeah. And I had a job in the massage parlour and I used to park my car bang outside the door mm. because I want... It's like I wanted people to talk about me because I wasn't any of those things. Mm. Do you understand? Yeah. A, a, a bit like up yours, like, because I wasn't those things. Mm. But obviously they were jealous, or I'm not saying they were jealous, whatever, you know, whatever I had. Even when you, you commit crime, it's still going to work. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, every single thing in life you pay the price for, mm -hmm whether it's looking over your shoulder, whatever it is, doing a prison sentence, having your family and friends, you pay the price in some way. But obviously it takes a long time. Some people never learn that yeah. that lesson. Yeah. But obviously I think that I've learned quite a lot of lessons in my life. And by then I think sometimes, because for me, I felt like I had to pay the price for things that I had no involvement in, i.e. my I mean. family dynamic, right? So once I've paid the biggest price, who even cares what the cost is after that? No. For all these consequences, no. like you start to lose sense of what that cost is because it's like, no. well, I've lost things that, you know. And I'm even, you know, going back to the, the violence thing and that, obviously you, you haven't got children, but even Dennis was such, like the kid's father, was such a waste of space and yet the kids adored him. Mm. And that, I think, is a big thing, like with women. And, and even, and you know, like when I had to leave my kids for the year, because I did a year up to three years, and the three weeks on top yeah. for the riot in Holloway. But whether this thing of, because you're supposed to be a mother, you're supposed to be with your kids. And I, you know, that, that was so wrong, the guilt that I felt over that. Mm. As I say, that, and as you said about, you know, you pay the price for other people, but what is, you know, what, how high a price can you, can pay? you pay? Yeah. Yeah. What, to put your life on the, on the line or whatever for someone else? Mm. That's really it, isn't it? I mean, yeah. when all's said and done. Yeah. And not having a sense of value of yourself, your own worth, and and being being willing to be that sacrifice um, um, because yeah. you don't have that value for yourself as well. Yeah. And then it's difficult because, it's like what we were saying yesterday on the phone, is like coming back from that and doing the work hand in hand. It's like ha one half of the conversation is forgiving what other people have done for us, or everything that we yeah. had lost before we even understood what was going on and whatnot. And then the other half is actually accepting that. After that, we put ourselves in dangerous situations and in diff and, and adopted difficult lifestyles, which now we have to learn how to forgive ourselves for. Yeah. And then we spend like the rest of our lives trying to make up for that in our own little way. It's the thing is, you know, from I call it two different lives, like my crack life, like this, this other Teresa, mm -hmm. because no, you wouldn't look at me now mm -hmm. and know what I was, mm. but I was a drug addict for 13 years. 38 times in prison, that just shows you, as I say, 36 for the crack, because obviously the other two I wasn't. But, and people wouldn't believe it, but this life I led, and the, the, I chose to put myself in those positions. You, you know, uh, someone normal off the street wouldn't just go in, into a crack house, or, you know, and then what happens to you when you're in those places? Mm. But obviously you put yourself in line for all that. This is the thing. You, mm. you, I'm not saying you're asking for it. I mean, it's you know, it's a little bit like this. These ignorant people that say yeah. that because you've got a short skirt and you're asking to be raped. Yeah. You know. You, you're not. It's no, no. Of course you're not. But obviously, this 
this person I'd become that knew nothing apart from seeing these girls in prison I knew nothing about that life mm. I want to ask you more about that life as well because I, you did mention earlier that like 90% of women who are living that lifestyle that are addicted to crack are prostitutes. I would say like, 99 point, no, this is my yeah. take on it. And remember, I've lived it. Yeah. 99.9% .9 of women and a lot of men that take class A drugs prostitute themselves mm. to get their money. Mm. That's my opinion. What did you do to get your money? I shoplifted. Right. So it's just the same type and of again, resources. Yeah. And again, horrendously because if you're gonna do it do it yeah so i wouldn't just nick one thing i'd started off you know with a coat nicking things under my coat like maybe 11 pairs of trousers or marx's was always my thing because you could sell it but in the end i had to i even went extras with that you see you know i used to get i mean i'm just it's just so mad at, you know when i think about back at it so i used to I'd started buying laundry baskets, like my cab driver would say, give me some money or whatever. But in the end, I'd nick the, laund the, the raffia laundry basket or whatever. You know, like the, the Alibaba basket? Yeah, yeah. And I would fill it up with the smallest, most expensive things, which was underwear. Mm. So, you know, and I know I would go into Marx's. I wouldn't look at anything else. I would go straight to the underwear because Marx's had my picture. They knew me, mm. uh, the whole of the country knew me because I used to go all over the place. So I used to wear wigs, glasses, changes. Once I went in in one wig, got they cottoned onto me. So I went out, changed my wig, changed my clothes, went straight back in the same shop. You know, this was, this was me. Yeah. So I'd go and I'd get the smallest, most expensive things. Some of the bras are like £30 in Marx's. Yeah. I once... I've got to sit on the edge of my chair to even tell you. Once, my ca someone was outside and I've rung him. Now, remember, I actually didn't have phones or anything. Whatever I had went to the crack dealer, mm. right? But I think that they've obviously given me a phone or whatever. I had a phone one day and gone the next. Anyway, so I've got the laundry basket. I've bought it and I've got... a ironing basket you know like the sort of flat ironing baskets yeah. in a carrier bag so i filled the laundry basket up like down on the bottom shelves then i filled the thing up and anyway, off i've gone making out it's not heavy because it's supposed to be just light isn't it like a plastic basket mm. i was really good at that like an actress the handles broke on the bag everything fell out no it oh. didn't fall out i mean i have had all that where I've dropped the things out of the coat. <laughs> anyway. But I've had to ring and I said, you've got to come in. I went, he went, no, no, I'm not. I went, you have to come in because otherwise I will be arrested because you have to come and carry this bag. I said, I will take the blame. You have to... I'd go up with three and a half thousand pounds in wow. like 30 seconds. Yeah. I, I was so extras again. The extras of me Extreme. and the extras of the crap. I wouldn't yeah. buy just rocks and stones and whatever you call it at the end of the night i would don't get me wrong but i would i knew that i was gonna so i would buy like you know if i had 800 pound I'd, I'd buy 800 Ounces. pounds worth yeah. you know whatever yeah um that was just me wow and um, you mentioned earlier you had 27 aliases. aliases yeah i wonder because like i feel like the common theme um that I, i'm getting from you is like you had a lot of masks throughout yeah. your life. Yeah. And like, at what point did you ask yourself, who am I? I don't know, but you know the 27 aliases? Yeah. I do believe from when you're educated, that's what I've always said, not to my children, because as you know, they weren't educated because of me. But when you are educated, you have choices. It's, you know, like for my other son, you know, if thing, I, I didn't bring him up. But I always said to him, you need to do that because then you have a choice. If you want to work in Marks and, um, at McDonald's or if you want to, fly, you, you know, rule the world, whichever, you've got a choice because if mm. you've got education behind you. So where I was educated, 
even though I was a, a horrendous crack addict, at the end of the day, I could say to the police, uh, once I was arrested and I'd got a black eye, it was all covered up, and I'd said, I met this guy, a, a black guy, mm. and my family have got nothing to do with me, and he's sending, send, sending me out shoplifting. You know, a little bit like the check, but they mm. wanted to hear that. Mm. They bailed me. Mm. It, you know, because, don't get me wrong, from when I was nicked, I was nicked. I never tried to fight or, you know, from when you're nicked, you're nicked. But at the end of the day, I always had a story because I wanted to smoke. All I want, all I needed, wanted, whatever, was to smoke crack. That was my life. Remember, the kids had gone, everything's gone by this time, Alia, everything. My lovely house with my bay window and round and chicken, chicken cushions and fireplace and round window. It's all gone. Mm. Everything's gone. My whole life is crap now. And again, as we know, I'm all or nothing. So it's all about the crack. And all I needed to do was get out to smoke more crack. Mm. So I had to get bail. So, and as I say, once I had 11 aliases when I finally was arrested and I got a solicitor that then, and once I'd gone to court in Highgate and they went, why is this woman got Securico around her? She's not, never been in trouble in her life. And I had to say to him, because I am not, so and so, so and so. I'm Theresa O'Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, you know, and a couple of times I've been nicked, and, and you know, like from when the fingerprints came in the machine where they knew who you were, mm. right? So there was no point bluffing. And they said, right, we're going to find out if you're not Theresa O'Sullivan. And I said, you go and find out because do you think anyone would want to be Theresa O'Sullivan? Mm. You go and have a look and come back. Who would want to be me with my, with what, with the record and, and the, you know, when you tap it in and it comes, it comes up. up yeah. But as I say, but again, this extras, extras, yeah. extras, extras. Yeah. So how did all of this impact the boys? It, they went from having this fabulous life, really social. The mum had a BM convertible with the top down, playing Bobby Brown and Gloria Estefan and going to the best restaurants, like monkey business, where there was all monkeys everywhere. And... He had his birthday, one of them, in a roller skate cafe where they were all going around on roller skates. Because, again, I don't know that... I know my own qualities, like, now, and I know that, that I'm stylish and I'm intelligent. I'm not unique, but, like, quite out there, mm. you know, and, and the next best, you, you know, yeah. and that lovely things for the kids and, you know, to to their mother becoming a drug addict, losing the car, um, to begin with not letting them in when they'd finished school. I'd gone back to my flat, not letting them in. And then they'd be climbing up the balcony and trying to get in, and me running out and trying to get in a cab. I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm being on the at-risk register, and, um, and my brother's girlfriend having to come and stay in the house with us. Mm. And obviously, don't get me wrong, the one thing that I take out of this, that I did do the right thing, is I, if I was smoking, I, I cleared off. I, I didn't smoke crack indoors. Or I, I would smoke when I, they were at school or whatever, mm. but then I would go, but hopefully before they finished school, because I didn't want anyone to see me. Mm. I was so ashamed, I didn't want anyone mm. to see me on one, you know. Do you know when I first started smoking crack? I wouldn't even eat or drink, I wouldn't even, not even a bit of water could pass my lips yeah. for like three weeks. Wow. I, I know that sounds absolutely mad. I could not even drink a glass of water. I, I wouldn't let anybody see me. I, I had the same clothes on. I mean, obviously. You used to binge, because like, for my, my mum was an al uh, alcoholic and she was addicted. Yes, um, initially. She would go and just wouldn't come back for days. Yes, that's exactly like that. what I did earlier. Yeah. And, I think that's worse because do you know what? Really, I should have just gone and never come back. And yeah. then, but I came back and every single time they thought it would be different, which I'm sure you did. Yeah. That's, I could cry for you. Yeah. I, that's when I want to cry is when I think about what those kids went through. Like, but, mm. so when I would come back, I'd be all sorry for myself. There'd be no money left. You know, then I'd, uh, 
and they'd obviously be so glad to see me back. But it's the same thing you're saying about your mind. You'd come back flat. Yeah. Oh, no, and, and sleep. And then I'd have sleep. to sleep. Yeah. Right? And then, and the other thing, there'd, there'd be no food because the kids had, had eaten the food. Mm. One of the kids' friends used to go shoplifting with Mark. Mark never did shoplift. But his friend used to go, I think, to Summer... I'm sure it was called Summerfield in Hythe anyway. And nick bits. Because mm. I'd leave Mark with no food in the fridge. Mm. You know, I don't know. I mean, obviously, and they would then think, you know, I've got letters that I've framed, like, to Holloway. That my, I thought it was Matthew that wrote, it was, it was Mark, saying, and when you get home, obviously, you've got to keep off that stuff, Mum. Mm. Um, he used to do a paper round mm -hmm. in Sandgate. Only he came down and lived in Sandgate with me because I've moved by that time. I have thought I'd leave London and leave the crack. But as it was, I then moved back to Folkestone. I had a house on the beach, this, like a picture, postcard, lovely. Yeah. And used to go up to London to get the crack. And he'd written to me and he went, you just got to leave that stuff and we're going to have a lovely life. So he, sh right, let's get back. He had a paper round. He then used to go and buy eggs and bacon. Uh, I mean, what, what? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know if I can even swear on it, but what on earth? Yeah. Buying food for his mum and him yeah and you know as I say and the other thing as I say only he was with me at the time Matthew had stayed with his dad Mark also used to lie and tell people that I was in bed so that social services and my mum wouldn't be on him mm. and I'll tell you just one instance of what I did to him mm. I don't know if this is relevant but f for kids and even though, as I say, my mum was there for him, he didn't want to, he didn't, he was too ashamed to tell my mum I'd gone. Yeah. I'd gone to, we lived in Sandgate, we'd gone up the hill in the car, and I said to him, right, you go to, I don't know if it was Blockbusters or KFC, and I'll go to, I think I'd sent him to Blockbusters, and I'll go to KFC, right? This was really late at night. I had Tintin slippers on, size 8 Tintin slippers, Pajamas, mm. I didn't even have a coat on, mm. right, or a handbag. Mm -hmm. That's how that just says it all. In that space of time that he's in the in the video shop, I decided I was going. It was late at night, it was snowing. Yeah. And off I went in the car. I left him one, he'd had nothing to eat. Mm. Two, it was snowing. He, I, I, I don't even know if I can even say it because I've, I probably have never actually... So he must have had to walk home and for three or four days not even tell anyone. He, he got done for bullying. The school threw him out of school because he'd asked someone for some, for some bus fare wow. to get to school because he used to go to... He still wanted to go to school and get his uniform on. Wow. And I've gone. Mm. And I think I turned... He then, my brother, took him to New York for Christmas. Matthew wouldn't go because he wanted, in case I came home. And I turned up Christmas Eve on the last train, skinny, dirty, obviously been at it for however many weeks. And then again, went in my old bedroom. Mm. As I say, Matthew was there because he wouldn't go to New York. Because again, mm -hmm. my brother had the money. Which, as I say, we're not here for my brother, but what what a thing. And then I wonder why he's, he's like he is. I mean, the, you know, but as I say, I fully own up to that. The knock-on effect of all these things. And in that split second, I wasn't going to smoke crack. Mm. I wasn't going to get on the motorway to London. Else I would have put my shoes on and got my coat on and got my handbag. Right. I went to London in pyjamas and slippers, let alone had, can you imagine? Mm. I obviously had money on me, so I went to the crack house, but then when the money's gone and the crack's gone, I'm in pyjamas and slippers. Yeah. But anyway, you don't, I didn't think ahead, as I say, but you think what that child, he was 12, tw was he 12? 12 or 13. Mm -mm. Not even, he didn't even have his brother there and he didn't even tell my mum. He could have run my mum and said, come and get me, nanny. Yeah. But he wanted 
again, for everything to be all right. And every time I went home, and sorry, every time I went home and every time they thought that I'd changed. And sometimes, listen, I'd sometimes be, be good for like three weeks, five months, eight months. And they would think that I'd changed. But I knew, Alia, something in me knew that I would go back. I wasn't in recovery. Mm. I just wasn't smoking at that time. Mm. Does that make sense to you? I don't mm. know. Yeah. I wasn't making any changes or, or trying to, to organise anything around recovery or, or staying clean. Or, because I was smoking. I just wasn't smoking at that time. What caused you to stop? What, 30, 38 times in prison later, 13 years the most horrendous, some of the most horrendous things. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to set myself with other people's standards, but for my, my personal, some of the lowest points that you could, I could ever have gone through uh, as myself. Mm. Um, I was at my 38th time in prison in Peterborough for some, and Mark, who I'd left in Folkestone that day, I'd seen him in Well Street in Tesco's. I was nicking something to eat in the morning. And um, he was in there because he scaffolded and the cafe was opposite where they used to meet up to have breakfast. And um, so I said, Mum, come on, come with me, Mum. So I went, no, I'll meet you afterwards. And he said, you won't, Mum, you won't. And I went, no, I will. And he came and got... I used to go to the snooker club in Chatsworth Road. Um, that was sort of my hangout. It's where I dyed my hair and anyway, because I was on the streets. Mm. You know, this is like 13 years later, obviously. And um, I ended up going over with him to where he lived. I, I had crack or whatever. Um, so then I'd got nicked. So for the... Don't get me wrong, when I first started going to prison, I'd ring the kids. Mm. But then after probably the sixth or seventh or eighth or ninth time of Matthew coming and, and saying that proper mums are fat and because I'd be really skinny. You know, I didn't ring them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I understood that they had to not have anything to do with me. Right. I, you know, I understood all that. Plus, I'd had a baby on crack. Like all, you know, it was a crack baby, mm -hmm. um, all those things. So anyway, so this particular time, when I was released from prison, Mark was outside waiting for me with my grandson, who was five. Um, it was November the 5th, 2005, but it was a Saturday, so I got released on the Friday. And um, I don't know. I don't know how I turned my life around. I did go back once and smoke mm -hmm. with loads of money, two phones, Mark's car. I had thousands in actual fact. Yeah. But somehow I turned my back on it. I don't know. I just thought, what on earth? This is, you know, this isn't for me. Mm. But I know that if I was to ever pick up a pub again, I don't think I, I, I could come back. You come back from it, yeah. Um, I mean, no. So I don't know what it was, but some sort of miracle. Well, we thank God for that miracle. Yeah, boy. brought me here. Honestly. Wow. You're you're resilient like i'm just blown away um by your story and like for more we reasons than one i think it was important for me personally to sit down with a woman with your type of background as well who has the repeated patterns of addiction and abuse in in, in her life yeah. from my own personal reasons yeah. my own personal growth because i think these are conversations i'll never get to sit down and have with my own mum no. with certain women in my family and i know you guys all come from a similar era no, so no. I really just appreciate. And, but I've got to add, mm. the 32 thing. I was 32 when I ever took drugs. Right. I mean, that that in itself is so late to go into the game. I say a game. I mean, it's not a game. But what I'm saying is that how am I, you know, the, the things that happened in my life, that's what I'm saying. It, you know, I, I used to look at Dennis being an alcoholic and, and think, you weak. But 
And what, but what happened to me mm. could happen to anybody. Mm. It could. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, from the life I'd had and being with someone that, that abused you, I don't know. It, you know, if it's one minute you're one way and the next minute... I, That's what I was going to say. I have like grew up around a lot of women that went to sleep one night. The next day, they were never themselves. No. And this is why I always say to our girls and our dadless daughters, like, this is life or death. Of course. Be definitely. aware of the questions, like be aware of the decisions and the consequences that, that you're making because one day you'll go to sleep and the next day you wake no, up and then next thing you know, your brain's working against you. You're doing things that you don't even understand. He, my first, he, th this guy that I used to buy for gave me a pipe, mm. but that was the worst thing he ever did because the thing being that then I wasn't, didn't have the money for him anymore, did I? No. Because I was spending the money on crack. Right. So in actual fact, he actually, that was his worst you know he made a really big mistake mm. but as i say because i then what well, didn't have the thousands of pounds to give him mm -hmm. for his habit because i had my own habit right and that's a different story for another day well i hope we do see you again another day uh and very soon actually uh just to let you know they've got a little self-care package behind oh, really? your, yes oh what you've <laughs> hidden it yes Behind your chair, this is um, sponsored by Solace. Oh, that's so when you go in so tonight, nice. you're reflecting on our conversation and stuff. Hope you can and like I'll some keep nice the bag counsel. forever and remember you, please. And please come back soon, man. It's conversations that we need to continue to yeah. have, you know. And I've learned a lot from I've this really conversation. I've really enjoyed it, and obviously things brought up that I didn't, that I'd obviously buried. Well, we, we appreciate you so much. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Nice to meet you. Thank All you, Teresa.